two. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our six at six. I think our third six at six this season will be having 10. Uh, a lecture series uh, from NKU uh, that celebrates uh, research uh, and creative activity by NKU faculty, students, and some of our community partners. I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement, uh, an NKU center that connects the campus and community, and your host for the Six at Six lecture series. So uh, thanks for being with us. We are live again tonight as we will be uh, uh, all season from the Southgate Street School in Newport, Kentucky. This is a school with a tremendous history. Uh, for 80 years, it was where the African-American uh, children of Campbell County were educated uh, from beginning uh, uh, almost immediately after the Civil War until Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s. In recent years, uh, it has become a community museum. NKU students have had the great opportunity to work uh, here and help uh, conceive of the museum. And one of the things that we have been active in trying to do as a university is bring programming uh, to the museum in the COVID era. Uh, we have to do it virtually, but we hope to see you here at uh, some point. And I would like to introduce Scott Clark from the city of Newport, who is the historic preservation officer and also uh, is directing the museum. So Scott, if you would just say a word about this special place. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're really excited to, to once again uh, have another presentation, uh, another incredible presentation of the Six at Six coming from the Southgate Street School. Uh, we're, very, we're very proud of the history of this school. It was 65 years ago that, they, that the children who had been receiving a stellar education here desegregated and they and the educators uh, literally crossed the color line and went down down the street to the next block to desegregate the schools uh, here in Newport. Uh, this particular building, we've been very fortunate in that uh, it has been maintained over the years, uh, allowing us to be able to open our museum. And this month we are celebrating uh, the third anniversary of the opening of the Newport History Museum at the Southgate Street School. Uh, there's a lot of magic and a lot of wonderful stories that, that uh, we tell here. Uh, hosting these series is just one of the, the opportunities and we look forward to having you all being able to visit our museum and hear more of the magical stories that happened uh, within these walls and within the community of Newport. Celebrating our 225th year uh, this year, uh, starting to celebrate this year um, and proudly celebrating our diverse past and making history every day. So once again, welcome here. We look forward to seeing you within these walls soon once uh, we're off of these restrictions, uh, but we are more than pleased to be part of this series and grateful to the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement and Mark Nykirk uh, for our collaboration over the years and our, the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And I will tell you that uh, uh, though you can't come and uh, be inside the museum and visit that way, if you're out and about and you want to see what it looks like uh, from the outside, there have been some renovations of the building in the past couple of months. Uh, it is on the alley. Uh, excuse me, it's actually a street, but it might look a little like an alley. It's cobblestone and it's right behind the Hofbrau house. I also would invite you to, if you haven't seen the mural on the uh, flood wall in Newport, uh, there will be a series of murals uh, on the flood wall. NKU uh, students are working on those. Uh, and the first one, uh, which is right to very close to where I-471 uh, comes into the, uh, uh, the river uh, front, uh, celebrates this school. And uh, it's the empowerment of education. Uh, the students who worked on it, uh, Gina Arardi, who is a recent graduate, it was her concept and she was painting it this summer. Uh, views uh, what the stories that she heard about this school as the empower, how education empowers. And in fact, if you meet uh, graduate uh, 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 people now in their 70s and 80s who went to school here, you will hear over and again the story of how uh, what happened in the walls of this school was the inspiration to tell uh, uh, kids that with an education, you can be anything. And uh, uh, so the uh, students who attended this school uh, went on to be very accomplished citizens of our community, uh, still contributing, and uh, the mural tells that story. 
Uh, the uh, second mural is underway uh, and a third one planning. There'll be nine altogether when the project is finished. So you can drive down the river uh, front to the flood wall in Newport and see the first one, see the second one in progress and continue in the coming months to see more of these being painted as this uh, a piece of, of uh, stories of Newport history are brought to life in the murals and, uh, and this vibrant art project. And uh, the other thing from uh, my perspective, because the university exists to uh, educate students and uh, our art students are getting the chance to do uh, real art in the community. Uh, all the things that we talk about in terms of learning outcomes of things that happen in the classroom are happening out in the real world. Uh, Gina, in fact, has her first job as a result of this and is working for the city of Newport as a, kind of the art director of this project. And uh, uh, the students who will be working on it in the future will get things for their portfolios and be able to talk about uh, uh, working on that project. And in fact, there have been, I think, about 15 classes that have worked on this museum, uh, public relations classes, business classes, history classes that have helped uh, this museum get off the ground. So it's continuing to be a school, you might say. So um, so thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, we have something a little different if you've been with us uh, uh, on the Six at Six series over the past uh, dozen years. Uh, we have a new partner this year uh, and it's a partner you will know about, uh, Thomas More University, uh, our uh, 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 co-university, uh, uh, another Northern Kentucky uh, institution. And uh, so this year, uh, Thomas Moore is our partner, and tonight's uh, speaker is Dr. Luis Sierra, who teaches history at Thomas Moore. Uh, and so we're delighted to have Thomas Moore as a partner in the Six at Six series. We are focusing this year on uh, the history and culture of Black Americans. And so you will find that all of our talks are on that uh, subject. Uh, and that is uh, also why we uh, particularly uh, enjoy being at Southgate Street School. Uh, Louise uh, teaches uh, history in general uh, at uh, Thomas More, but he has a, a, an interest uh, in uh, African American history. He and I partnered uh, earlier uh, uh, this year in the summer to do a, a workshop for teachers in Northern Kentucky on how to teach race and history. So uh, that's how we uh, got to know one another. And I'm delighted to have Dr. Sierra with us to, this evening to talk about the Grimke sisters. He'll tell you more, but uh, they were uh, products of antebellum, the antebellum South, uh, uh, South Carolina, I believe. And they did something we could all uh, learn uh, learned from, and that is to change their point of view uh, on race relations. Uh, and uh, perhaps their example is an example to us. Dr. Sierra, welcome. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, first of all, I'd like to thank the Newport History Museum and the Southgate Street School and the executive director here, Scott Clark, for hosting us this evening. I'd also like to thank the NKU uh, Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement and Thomas More University's Institute for Religious Liberty. And of course, uh, the wonderful Norse, Norse Media students and uh, director who are uh, doing everything possible to make this run as smoothly as possible. So I'm very grateful to be here. Um, the Grimke sisters, who are two women from South Carolina, and most people don't know very much about them or maybe anything about them. And so I wanted to tell their story because they're pioneers of abolition and women's rights. And in telling the Grimke sisters story, one of the things I want to do is connect us between their own biography and a larger historiography and what's happening in the larger context of the United States. So I will pull these narrative threads through the larger context to weave a story together of how these women were both a product of their time and also pioneers in their time. And part of that is I wanted to share how unique the sisters were, how unique their story is, and then again, their pioneering acts. Context here is really important for anchoring us in the uh, larger story of why the sisters are important and why they're unique and why they matter. 
often people say, you know, what is the point of history? Is it to learn from the past or is it something else? Is it to imagine a different future from what we've already tried? And for me, I think that that is key, a key point to make that history is there to help us imagine a different future rather than simply teaching us lessons. And I offer in that spirit, the story of the Grinky sisters in the context of an industrializing nation in a period of social tension where the sisters are involved in a much larger movement of reform and religious reawakening. And it's in that context that their pioneering work on abolition and women's rights should be situated. And I'll return to what I think should be the lessons from the sisters at the end of the lecture. What makes the sisters unique, I think, is various things that we'll explore over the course of the lecture. But I want to make sure that we follow four kind of narrative threads through the entire presentation and then also situate the sisters in their larger and broader context. And so political activism is the first thread that I'll sort of cover. And what I want to say about that is women's role in public was largely constricted in the 19th century to the point where women speaking to mixed audiences, meaning men and women, they was seen, it was not seen as a good thing necessarily. And it was often a cause for concern in communities. Uh, at the time. And so that political activism that abolition brings forward also opens up an avenue for women's rights. And all of that is made possible because of the religious reform movements that occur in the early 19th century. So those four threads will weave in and out of the lecture as I lay out some of the broader historical contextual features Jacksonian democracy named after Andrew, Andrew Jackson, who um, was this, you know, um, I think North Carolina, South Carolina kind of fight, kind of fight over his birthplace, but uh, he was a Tennessee back, backwoodsman and sort of uh, representative of this period of expanding democracy. At the same time, we have the removal of the Indians from the U.S. Southeast. Right, that is the Cherokee, the Choctaw, um, Seminoles, uh, Creeks, and Chickasaw. All of those tribes are forced to move west, and that Indian removal is actually intimately tied to the expansion of slavery and to Western expansion, because the areas these Indians are moved out of are the same areas where the cotton culture and the cotton kingdom expands into. And then lastly, I'll bring in this larger contextual feature that uh, sort of marks all of the 19th century and is an important feature of why the sisters are pioneers and why they face so much backlash. And this is women's proper role in society and the idea of the cult of domesticity or that women belonged in the private sphere. So the two Grimke sisters that um, fought for abolition were Sarah and Angelina Grinke. Sarah was the sixth of 14 children and Angelina was the 13th of 14 children. The difference in ages between the two, uh, Angelina was the 13th of 14, 14 children. The um, age difference between the two is about 13 years. Um, so you get a sense of, of how old they are um, in, in relation to each other. Um, Sarah, as a child, recalls that at the age of five, she saw a slave being whipped. And in that, she decided that she wanted to leave this place because, and board a steamer because she wanted to go to a place where there was no slavery. Later, in violation of the law, she taught her personal slave to read. And those two kind of little narrative uh, points there, they are really important features of Sue Monk Kidd's book, The Invention of Wings, which takes the sister story and uh, turns it into uh, a fictional narrative. Um, but the story of the sisters is actually, I think, even more unique than that fictionalized account. 
Sarah wanted to become a lawyer originally and follow, follow in her father's footsteps. Her father had been uh, chief judge of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Um, she would teach herself geography, history, and mathematics from the books in her father's library, and her brother would help her brush up on her Latin. That is until her father found out, and at that point, he shut down all of that and did not allow her to study, even though he knew, because he told her that she would have become the greatest lawyer South Carolina would have ever seen if she'd been a man. After her studies ended then, Sarah begged her parents to allow her to be, become Angelina's godmother, which they uh, acceded to. And she became a role model to her younger sister and the two sisters remained close all of their lives. Angelina, in fact, often called Sarah mother. By 1835, both women have left the South. Both women have converted to Quakerism and both are now settled, have settled by that point in Philadelphia and they belong to the Philadelphia Quaker community. So a full decade before the Seneca Falls Convention, which is recognized as the moment where the fight for women's rights begins, a full decade before that, Angelina Grimke writes her address to Southern women, imploring them based on women's gender and also their intimate knowledge of the Southern slave system, imploring them to fight for abolition. Likewise, her sister wrote a series of letters appealing for women's rights using scripture as the basis for the appeal of equality and also in that process developing rather sophisticated notions of gender and sex as well as pioneering um, novel analyses of racial prejudice, oppression, mob violence, white supremacy, um, and the status quo in the North, as well as the South. They would attack both of those things. But we have heard so little about these remarkable women, and I'm not sure why. So maybe that's a question that I will leave open, uh, possibly for discussion then. Within this context of the 1830s um, America and what is going on, we have the development of the Jacksonian democracy. This is the expansion of universal white male suffrage. We see appointed offices becoming elective in this period. And then we see the development of state -wide, wide party organizations, which enable the development of a two party system with a loyal opposition as part of that. This is the beginning of the modern party systems as we know them. And in fact, Jackson, Andrew Jackson will be backed by the Democratic Party, which will develop in response to um, him feeling, ha him having had one of, the, uh, one of the elections stolen from him. In the next cycle, um, the Democratic Party expands out into new territories, creates these great structures that then enable Jackson to really put together a national um, campaign. So Jacksonian democracy then is marked by universal white male suffrage. Most states by the 1820s had removed the barriers to voting. Um, so many Americans own land that some of those barriers didn't change very much. But in some states, um, they removed the property requirement altogether, and all that was necessary was to pay taxes. So the expansion of white male suffrage enables the increase in participation that we see over the course of the 1830s and 1840s. So we get participation that goes from about 27% in the 1820s to participation over 78% in the election of 1840, which just dwarfs any uh, participation of the modern era as we just saw in this previous election. Um, it, it even dwarfs the levels of participation from that. 
these um, appointed offices that became elective meant that judges, legislators, um, and executive officers had to go out into communities and campaign and convince people that they represented the voters' fears and concerns and interests. Elections become these festive and dramatic um, occasions, not unlike what happens with the Great Awakening and um, the religious revivalism that also occurs at these times, these big outdoor tent meetings um, where people will be converted to e evangelical Protestantism. In addition to this, we see that the presidential elections shift from electors being elected by the uh, state legislatures and that switching to a popular vote, uh, electors being chosen by popular vote by 1828. All of this leads to a very stable two-party system with the concept of a loyal opposition included within that. And then it also tended to restrict the temptation to abuse power. It also institutionalizes the spoil system. So this is the context in which the sisters are uh, becoming aware of and open to abolitionism. And it's in fact, radical reform that catches their eye um, significantly. And it's um, in fact, the Lane Seminary debates uh, in Cincinnati, the Lane Seminary is in Cincinnati, uh, was in Cincinnati, sorry. And um, it was run by Lyman Beecher, um, one of the student leaders, Theodore Weld, who would go on to become one of the great voices of abolition. He organizes a series of debates on slavery and abolition. These debates take um, 18 nights to complete. And by the end of those 18 nights, a, a high percentage of the student body is converted to what was called immediatism or immediate emancipation over gradual emancipation programs and then over colonization schemes, which were um, some of the other options available at the time. So the sisters first learn about this through the Lane Seminary, Lane Seminary debates and, um, and newspaper reports about those debates. The sisters are also very aware that the Quakers are not, mainland Quakers are not particularly interested in talking about abolition or talking about slavery. And they also see how even the Quakers um, follow a segregated um, seating arrangement in a meeting some of their dear friends and people who they, who, with whom they had boarded in uh, Philadelphia, Sarah Douglas and her daughter Mary, had, were African-American Quakers who had to sit on a segregated bench, right? So they, they were experienced, experiencing Northern racial prejudice as much as they had seen uh, Southern slavery. Um, the organizers of the uh, Lane Seminary debates are threatened with expulsion um, because some of the students who converted to immediatism, they were Southerners and they went back home and told their planter fathers that they wanted to manumit their slaves. And that went over very poorly, of course. Um, and so it caused a lot of problems for Theodore Weld and the, a lot of problems for Theodore Weld and the other students. Um, they were threatened with expulsion. That threat of expulsion then led the so-called Lanes rebels to, uh, resign their position, they resign their positions, and they go on to help found Oberlin College as well as the American uh, Anti-Slavery Society. And Theodore Weld in particular uh, was not only a leader of that movement, but also instrumental and probably the most dynamic of the abolition agents of the antebellum period. Angelina, who was always the more forceful and plain spoken of the two sisters, decided to do as she had always done when she wanted to change what was happening. She decided to research about what she wanted to change. She decided to write about it. She decided to debate it. And then she decided that she would go for abolition and immediate abolition after having done her research in two of the most important newspapers of uh, abolition, The Emancipator and The Liberator. And in it, she finds that many of the abolitionists had been grossly slandered. Their ideas had not been given a fair reading. And as Sarah told it, Angelina realized that her principles were the principles 
of these abolitionists. And these were people with whom she could work to free the slave. It seems that Angelina's moment of conversion was having heard George Thompson, the British abolitionist speak when he argued that the brutality of the slave system in the South was not sanctioned by the Bible and this kind of slavery was not sanctioned by the Bible, it led to her conversion. In addition, he advocated for women to be a central part of the abolition movement. By 1835, both women had converted to uh, immediate abolitionism, and they uh, joined the Female Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, one of the founding members of that was Lucretia Mott, who would then go on to help found the women's rights movement <clears throat> in 1848. So Angelina's conversion is actually marked by the fact that George Thompson faced so much opposition in the North it was a surprise to her that he would face this kind of opposition and threat of mob violence. In the South, she felt like a violent reaction was never in doubt. But in the North, she was appalled at the idea that these ideas could not even get a fair hearing. Because of that, she writes a letter to William Lloyd Garrison, um, the abolitionist and publisher of The Liberator. He she writes a letter that is very personal and forthright to him where she argues that his stand on immediate abolition is, quote, holy ground, never surrender it. If you surrender it, the hope of the slave is extinguished. If persecution is the means which God has ordained for the accomplishment of this great end, emancipation, I feel as if I could say, let it come. For it is my deep, solemn and deliberate conviction that this is a cause worth dying for, end quote. And that letter, she frets over sending it and finally decides that she will. She is unaware that Garrison is going to publish it. He publishes it without her knowledge or her permission, though she later admits that she figured that he probably would publish it. Um, she's immediately condemned, not only in the South, but also, and surprising to her, by the mainland Quakers with whom she had been uh, interacting in Philadelphia. And she burns bridges in the South to the point where Mrs. Grimke, the mother, is told that if Angelina comes back, nobody can guarantee her safety. And so uh, Angelina never returns to South Carolina. And it's a similar um, case for Sarah. Sarah returned in the uh, early 1830s, but then never again returns after 1834. So at the same time that we're seeing this move for abolitionism and the expansion of white male suffrage, we also have the development of the Indian removal process. And again, I just want to highlight these regions and where these people were moved from west, right? And this is all intimately tied to Western expansion and the expansion of slavery. And of course, the expansion of cotton in the regions where the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, Cherokee, and the Creek uh, peoples had lived, right? They're pulled from their ancestral homeland and they're forced to move into uh, what is the Oklahoma Territory now. And we often forget that the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Creek are also part of this. Most people only hear about the Trail of Tears as it uh, relates to the Cherokee, and most people only know that story. But all of these uh, indigenous groups were forced to go west. The, it's known as the Trail of Tears, of course, because of the um, death and devastation this uprooting had on um, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Creek, as well as the Seminoles. The Cherokee in particular, I can give you just a, a quick snippet. About 17,000 Cherokee are forced to leave in 1836 and 1838. Uh, roughly 4,000 of them die en route to um, uh, Oklahoma Territory and another untold number tie as a result of, of, of the tr uh, trip itself, right? Beyond dying on the trail. So all of that 
fits in this larger narrative context, right? We're expanding rights for one set of people, but then repressing the rights for another set of people. Um, and it's interesting because these uh, indigenous peoples in particular, they probably had a really good opportunity to actually integrate into America in a lot of ways. I mean, they adopted American names, adopted uh, the alphabet. Um, th there could have been an opportunity to integrate these people. I mean, it wasn't to be because history wasn't like that, but um, it's interesting that that was not really seen as an option at the time as well. So radical abolition and the Grimke sisters, they quickly come to find out that mob violence would be a feature of all abolitionist meetings. Um, and it would occur again and again in the North. And the sisters come to realize that this is, the reason for this is racial prejudice and white supremacy. And they will lay that out over the course of the, their lecture tour and in their writings. What they learn as they prepare to go out on their lecture tour is how to stand up to the mob and how to get a fair hearing. What does help uh, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, of course, is that they were women, they were elite women, and they were religious women, and that helps them uh, face the mobs. But Theodore Weld, who trains the sisters, talked about the best way to deal with the mob. And he, he stuck to his nonviolent principles. He said the first night what you had to do is you had to stare down the mob and be willing to face violence, right? And by the second and third night, you'd have enough men in the local community interested in hearing what you have to say because you're willing to get beat up for it. And so those two or three men would then become the escort for, well, to get a hearing at least. And that's how he broke down that resistance. As a result of the letter that she wrote to, that Angelina wrote to uh, William Lloyd Garrison, she becomes a sort of celebrity and she and Sarah decide that they're going to live their principles and they begin sitting with their dear friends the Douglases, the two African-American women who belong to their meeting. Um, and they begin sitting on the so-called colored bench or the segregated bench. By 1836, it is clear that Angelina wants to leave uh, the church and she does. Sarah is finally convinced to do the same. And in that summer, Angelina writes her appeal to the Christian women of the Southern states. This will, um, be the basis for her lecture tour, uh, her and Sarah's lecture tour that occurs over 1837 and 1838. In this appeal, in simple, direct language, as though she were addressing them in person, Angelina appealed to former friends to listen to her for the sake of old bonds, and to those whom she did not know, she asked to listen because she addressed them in love. The core of her argument was her belief in the manhood and equality of the slave and in his natural right to freedom. She refuted the biblical arguments for slavery in detail, reviewing many biblical laws, which made Hebrew servitude uh, far better than Southern slavery. And unlike Hebrew servitude with its provision for the periodic freeing of all slaves and for its careful safeguards of the rights of slaves, the legal structure in the South robbed the slave of all his rights as a man. Slavery, in fact, required the breaking of the man in order to make the slave fit for purpose. That the slave is not fitted to slavery is evidenced in the insurrections that regularly rippled through slaveholding societies. She appealed to women for four basic reasons. She said, women can read on a subject, they can pray over a subject, they can speak on a subject, and then they can act on a subject. And she thought that if they could do all of those things, they could definitely then petition Southern legislatures for the abolition of slavery. That appeal then becomes the basis for much of her abolitionist writings. Sarah, in a similar fashion, also leaves Quakerism. And she leaves the ministry. In fact, she tried to become a minister, but um, un unbeknownst to her, she got uh, sort of 
entangled in internal Quaker politics and the division between Hicksite Quakers who are a little bit more radical and the sort of mainline Quakers with whom she was more familiar with. Those Quakers, uh, though they did accept women into the ministry, they weren't particularly supportive of Sarah and Sarah her personality was one where um, if anybody said anything negative or, uh, about her, she would just immediately shut down. And so um, she wasn't encouraged in the ministry. And when all this, uh, all these issues with abolition occur, they just drive her to leave the ministry and then leave Quakerism as well. What it does though, is it then opens up a space for the sisters to meet other Quakers who are more radical, so more like them, and then it leads to an introduction to the radical reformers of the 19th century. And what's decided in those meetings is that the sisters will go on a speaking tour, um, uh, providing a series of anti-slavery parlor talks to women around the Northeast. And they'll be trained by the anti-slavery society and in particular by Theodore Weld, um, who by this time, his voice was shot. He uh, really couldn't speak in public anymore. So what he was doing was training others to do the work of bringing people into uh, the abolitionist movement. Um, the sisters get to speak for the very first time in public in a Baptist church, and then in the session room of another church before the clergy and the more conservative clergy of the Northeast begins to find it problematic that these women are speaking in public and potentially speaking to mixed male and female audiences. And that leads to kind of a backlash against them. And um, they struggle often to find spaces in which to meet. And it's actually the women of the communities where they go that enable them and find them spaces to meet when uh, the typical avenues of the church or the town meeting house were closed to the sisters. Angelina's letter highlights for us the importance of the various views of women's rights in the United States at the time. Her letter, not only does it get condemnation in the South and from uh, people who are against abolition and uh, Northerners who think women should not be writing or speaking in public, it also garners some backlash from um, abolitionists who were a bit more conservative, I would say. So Catherine Beecher, the educator and daughter of Lyman Beecher and sister of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she writes uh, an essay on slavery and abolitionism with reference to the duties of the American female. And she addresses it specifically to Angelina Grimke. And in it, she talks about what the proper duties of a woman are. She argues that women are subordinate to men by divine law, and that is the way it should be, and there is a reason for that. In addition, for her, women were not supposed to be in public. They are not supposed to be involved in politics because that is a man's domain. Men should be the ones involved in the uh, economic sphere and out in the political sphere. Because men were the face of the family, that's why they had the right to vote. Uh, was her argument. Catherine Beecher also said that why should women vote at all since they don't have really a public role? And second, she doubted the wisdom of even allowing women to petition for themselves. It was one of the few rights women retained at the time and she didn't see the wisdom in it because she said that if you can't even convince your husband or your brother or your friends to sign a petition on your behalf, the fact that you have the ability to uh, petition on your own doesn't bode well, right? That was her argument to this. Angelina will reply to uh, the essay in a series of 12 letters called the letters uh, to Catherine Beecher. And in 10 of them, she really focuses on immediate abolition and she tears down all of the arguments for gradual abolition as well as uh, the idea of colonization, right? That was another scheme that was put forward is uh, sending the freed slaves or free African-Americans to the colony of Liberia uh, in Africa. That had already happened. Um, some uh, American, uh, African-Americans had settled there already, but most of them um, were already free people uh, to begin with. They hadn't been enslaved and then manumitted and then sent. Um, 
But the, the point I'm making to you about Catherine Beecher there, she was part of that movement that argued for colonization. So it's a more conservative movement. Uh, Angelina replies, 12 letters again, uh, letters, the letters to Catherine Beecher, in, and they're published in William Lord Garrison's newspaper. 10 of them focus on abolition, two focus on women's rights. And I'll come back to um, what she says in one of the letters in just a second, because I think it uh, encapsulates very well uh, the sisters thinking. All of this becomes problematic, of course, because of women's roles and women's rights in the early 19th century. And in particular is this imposition or the uh, rise of the cult of domesticity and the idea of women belonging in the home while men belong in public, this idea of separate spheres. And the cult of domesticity was really this glorification of the home as the center of all efforts to civilize and Christianize society. So women are set up as the educators and the moral guardians of the home and the family. They are there to protect the family, right? And then to give the husband a refuge from the crazy workaday world that is um, taking shape as a result of the market revolution, basically the industrialization of the United, uh, the United States Northeast at the time um, causes a lot of disruption and dislocation. And what we see Americans doing is increasingly tying themselves to a variety of moral and uh, ethical schemes, right? Religious reform, but also uh, the anti-temperance, I'm sorry, the anti-temperance, the temperance movement, that's the uh, anti-alcohol movement, um, and other reform movements, right, as a result. And women participate in these in that um, private sphere role, right, as moral guardians. That's how they enter the public in that sense. We have these new conceptions of gender roles that are sort of laid out in novels and magazines and literature that glorify women who stay home, who keep a, hot, a spotless house, who nurture children, who give the husband a refuge from the working world. It also places these women above men because of their uh, supposed higher morality and um, less um, the, the higher morality than men. Um, and it allows them then to also rationalize male dominance. And let's be really clear here, this is not the same for working class women, certainly not the same for working class men or African-American men and women for the most part. This idea of the cult of domesticity and the idea of separate spheres is something that the middle and upper classes impose on themselves first and then uh, try to make the values for society. And they really do succeed. I mean, their values are the values we still uphold today. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, the idea that you, um, that this is a merit-based society in which anybody who works hard can uh, strive for better and, and get better, right? All of those values come out of this period and they're very much middle-class values as we even um, sort of see them today, I would argue. This then allows women to enter the reform movements as women, you know, from their private sphere area. They are moral guardians. That's how they enter uh, into the public world as members of evangelical church associations in uh, social and political activism to end various vices, dueling, gambling, prostitution, and of course, alcohol. They, that, their role as moral arbiters then allows them to enter into political and social activism because it's simply seen as an extension of the feminine sphere. That opens up the door to abolitionism and to abolition uh, work. And then of course, to the women's rights movement. So women in politics is really a novelty and Angelina sees Catherine Beecher's letter and response to it. And she lays out her response again in 12 letters around two basic ideas. Women were citizens. They had duty to, to perform just as men have duties to perform. And then secondly, she provided evidence of Northern complicity in Southern slavery. In laying those two arguments out, she takes down the typical arguments 
from the Bible that defends slavery. And then she shows the complicity of Northerners in Southern slavery. She argues, for example, that the slave trade continues to occur in the Washington DC area, just a few short steps from the Capitol. Why hasn't that ended? Since the inception of the country, seven slave states had been admitted into the union. Why would you do that? Northern participation in the return of fugitive slaves, again, complicit in Southern slavery. And then the silence of Northern ministers on the question of slavery and abolition. Beyond that, she argued that Northerners participated in commercial and banking enterprises with Southern slaveholders, and they purchased goods made by slave labor. In addition to all of that, they contended that it was Northern race prejudice and white supremacy that was the real buttress of slavery. That is what upheld slavery in the North, is racial prejudice and white supremacy. And in that way, it was a quite a groundbreaking argument. Angelina, in her letter, in one of her letters to um, Catherine Beecher talking about women's rights shows us just how forceful and forthright she is in asserting women's equality. She argues that on the question of women and their ability to petition, she argues that not only should they be allowed to petition, but they should in fact, that right should be augmented with other rights. Women should have a say in quote, the laws that govern them in both church and state. Anything less was a violation of human rights and a rank usurpation of power, end quote. So it is Angelina on the speaking tour writing to Catherine Beecher and making that argument where she lays out the equality of women. It's Sarah who actually writes much more on the equality of the sexes. She writes a series of letters um, on the equality of the sexes that are published during the speaking tour as well. And her arguments are also quite sophisticated. She differentiates between gender and sex. She highlights the fact that um, in the Bible, there is no mention of women's subordination to men. And she does this really interesting analysis of the, um, the story of the fall and original sin. And she argues that women, was not, women were not brought to this earth to be subordinate to men, but to be a partner to men in equality. In addition, she blames Adam for the fall, arguing that because he had been around and because he knew the Garden of Eden, he was the one who should have been responsible for teaching Eve why things happen the way they do. Instead, he abdicated his responsibility, according to Sarah. So both of them are arguing something that's quite pioneering and quite um, cutting edge at the time, but they are still women of their age. As I mentioned, Theodore Weld um, was their trainer and he helped them. He also helped them sharpen their thinking on both abolition and the women's rights question. And in fact, the sisters started speaking about both topics during their New England tour and Weld kind of convinces them that no, no, they got to focus on abolition. Though he agrees that equality for women is right up there and that women of course should be able to speak in public, this is not the time. We focus on abolition and then we work on women's rights uh, at a different moment, but you're out there as abolitionists so they take his advice. They don't stop writing about either abolition or women's rights, but they do only focus in their speeches on women's rights. And the speaking tour, we, don't, we can't really say what its ultimate effect was. We can talk about what a whirlwind tour it was and how many uh, meetings they uh, went to and how many towns they uh, also uh, went to and how many people they uh, supposedly um, met face to face. I say supposedly because, of course, uh, Gerda Lerner, who is one of the uh, one of the major historians who writes about the Grimke sisters, um, she estimates the crowds at that level. Um, so the tour itself was 23 weeks long. It had 
uh, 87 stops, 67 towns, and again, Lerner estimates that 40,000 people went to heard the sisters speak over the course of those 23, 23 weeks. Their speaking tour culminates in a speech before the Massachusetts um, legislature for Angelina. And then the speaking tour ends and they return to Philadelphia. In the last six weeks of the speaking tour, Angelina and Theodore Well declare their love for each other uh, in a series of letters. And for those last six weeks, they kind of go back and forth deciding how they're going to get married, uh, what kind of people they are. I mean, Weld writes these letters where he's telling her about all of his flaws and will she still accept him? And, uh, you know, she mocks him gently and says, of course I will. And then she talks about all of her flaws and will he still accept her? You know, after these six weeks of uh, talking with each other, uh, Weld writes to her and he says, okay, he's ready and he's ready to enter in a into a true reformer's marriage, which will be a partnership for him. Uh, they decide that they're going to get married in a civil ceremony in um, Philadelphia at the house of... Um, Angelina and Sarah's um, widowed sister, Ms. Mrs. Anna Frost, who lived on Spruce Street. Um, and they set the date for the marriage as May, May 14th of 1838. And they pick that date for a really, really specific reason. It is just before the opening of Pennsylvania Hall. And Pennsylvania Hall would be the reformers' answers to all of the intimidation all of the mob violence, and then all of the uh, doors that had been closed to them on their speaking tours. Pennsylvania Hall um, cost $40,000 to build in 1838. It was built with uh, 2,000 uh, subscribers' money, each um, putting forward about, not about, they putting forward $20 for that subscription. Many women were subscribers to um, Pennsylvania Hall, in fact. And so I went and did the calculations, about $1.1 million, roughly $40,000 in today's money, and a share would, have, would be costing around $560 today. So you can get a sense of uh, you know, the cost of, of uh, being able to uh, subscribe to and be a member of Pennsylvania Hall. So this again, a three-story, beautiful, magnificent building with a large meeting hall and galleries on the second and third floor, as well as conference spaces on that first floor. And the idea was to give a space to unpopular um, opinions, unpopular um, um, movements, in order to enable the free speech question to exist, right? In other words, they're pushing forward this idea that free speech is something that we all have access to, including those of us who have unpopular opinions. And here is Pennsylvania Hall, a place where you can go and actually have your unpopular ideas heard. Um, and so the, Wedding is the 14th of May. The next day, there is an opening uh, inauguration for the American Anti-Slavery Society and the um, American Female Anti-Slavery Society, um, which both the sisters will participate in. Um, so by the first, the end of the first evening, the end of the Monday, they know there's going to be trouble. There's a crowd outside of people who are throwing stuff and just this mob is sort of collecting and that's going to mark all of the proceedings the entire week. By Wednesday night, rumors are circulating throughout Philadelphia that the meetings on that Wednesday are going to include a mass mixed race wedding and race amalgamation and all of these um, crazy rumors kind of float around Philadelphia and a crowd gathers outside Pennsylvania Hall that Wednesday evening. The trustees of Pennsylvania Hall are immediately horrified by this crowd and they ask the um, women who are meeting in the hall, and yes, it is a mixed race meeting, but it's a mixed race meeting of women who are advocating for abolition. Um, the trustees ask them to, to please shut down their meeting. They're gonna close the doors to the hall and they're gonna give the key to the mayor. And they do that. They close down the hall, they shut down the meeting, they close the doors um, to Pennsylvania Hall. Uh, they lock them, they give the key to the, uh, to, to the mayor. 
And the mayor tells the crowd, listen, you have uh, what you wanted, you've accomplished. The meetings have been shut down. There will be no further meetings this evening. You know, please disperse and go home. The mayor trusts his fellow citizens that nothing untoward will happen. He decides not to call the police and he goes away with the, uh, with the key to Pennsylvania Hall. By nightfall, mysteriously, all of the street lamps around Pennsylvania Hall have gone out. By 8.30, mysteriously, uh, the doors have been busted open and um, the entire hall is on fire. By the time the mayor returns, the hall is literally on fire and the police can do nothing about it except watch basically. And by the next morning, the hall is a smoldering wreck. Undeterred, the women of the female um, anti-slavery society find an alternate meeting place. And the very, the first two things they resolve are quite interesting. One of them is that mob violence is the cornerstone of white supremacy and that it is no accident that the abolitionists have been attacked here. What is interesting to note, there are two things. One is that an African-American uh, orphanage asylum was also burned down that same night. And interestingly, the Pennsylvania legislature at this time is debating giving suffrage to all free white males in Pennsylvania, something that will then pass in October. This year is also the last year that free African-American men will vote until the Civil War. So Pennsylvania Hall burns down and in a lot of ways, it marks the retirement of the sisters. They will only speak in public uh, a handful of times ever again. Um, they will work with uh, Theodore Weld on a very important text called American Slavery As It Is, The Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses. This text was produced by the American Anti-Slavery Society and the sisters were key to its development. Um, they helped well do all of the research. The sisters essentially acted as a clipping service for him. Weld went down to the New York Stock Exchange at the time they, they lived in Fort Lee. He went down to the New York, New York Stock Exchange and purchased old newspapers that were gonna be thrown out and he took them home and the sisters sort of go through them and catalog them and arrange the clippings uh, by topic, you know, diet, clothing, um, housing, working conditions and the like. As the book's introduction says, um, it's Southern newspapers themselves who give the best account and evidence of the mistreatment of slaves, because these advertisements will talk about, you know, uh, the maiming of a particular slave or, um, you know, the branding of a particular slave or, um, you know, their facial features with, which uh, demonstrate, right, clear uh, abuse and torture. And the American Entry Slavery Society um, also invited people to call on their offices if they wanted to find the information themselves that they'd uh, seen in the book. In other words, come and check our sources. Uh, nobody has ever disputed their sources, in fact. Um, and um, it's said that Harriet Beecher Stowe took much of her inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin from uh, some of the information and the eyewitness testimony that um, Theodore Weld and the sisters collected and then published for the American Anti-Slavery Society. So as the sisters head into retirement, they are also a product of their, they are also a product of their moment. They had been super abolitionists, now they're gonna be super homemakers. Um, and they want to take on the domestic sphere and do it as well as possible. And they just want to be superstars in the domestic sphere as well. Um, Angelina and Theodore Welt marry, and they decide that Sarah will live with them for the rest of her natural life. Angelina has two children, um, multiple miscarriages, and severe health issues as a result of uh, those miscarriages and the constant pregnancies. Um, it's unclear what exactly was wrong with her. Uh, Lerner speculates that it might have been a prolapsed uterus. It's, it's not clear from the letters or any of the documentation because all of this kind of referenced in allusions and, um, and, and, and not really um, 
clearly and plainly discussed. Um, and so she kind of guesses at that part of it. But like other reformers, they also believe in various other causes. Um, they, for example, followed the Graham diet, which was kind of this, uh, all the food is eaten cold. It's a raw kind of vegetarian diet. Uh, they didn't believe in purchasing any slave produced commodities. So they wouldn't buy cotton, for instance, that was produced by slave hands or any other product that had been uh, produced by slave labor. And of course, they are also heavily involved in communes and utopianism. And they in fact join a utopian community as the communities educators uh, in Raritan Bay. And this will really be the second career of, maybe the third career of all three of them. They will become fantastic educators um, doing things that were not common in the 19th century. So inquiry-based inquiry methods, for instance, was one of the things that Well did in a period where rote memorization was the main uh, sort of pedagogy pedagogical tool. And then, of course, uh, physical punishment was the uh, rod with which you were uh, trained. This, of course, was not the way the Welds and, uh, and Sarah ran their school. It was, uh, again, inquiry-based um, and much more open. It was co-educational. It was also mixed race. They took in African-American students as well as um, uh, white students. And um, some of the who's who of the reform movement end up sending their children to uh, the Grimke sisters and well to be educated. The sisters find out that they have um, nephews by one of their brothers who are um, the product of his relationship with a slave woman. Um, they offer to pay for their nephew's education. They uh, bring them to their home. Uh, one of them goes back to the South. The other does take up uh, education and does end up living uh, in the North. The sisters are also constantly, uh, and well, also constantly receiving visitors. They will live virtually a hand to mouth existence all of their lives, never live comfortably, but um, they will extend hospitality to friend and stranger alike. Uh, including their uh, dear friends, the Douglases. I know I've brought them up three times already, but the Douglases come to visit and stay with them and um, they leave after one night and this really hurts Angelina's feelings. Um, and she tells the Douglases that it hurt her feelings that they only stayed one night and that you know they're trying to do their best to be open and inviting and live their principles. And uh, they couldn't figure out why uh, the Douglases were so uncomfortable. Um, in that exchange of letters, of course, the Douglases do come, at, come back later and stay with them and do stay for an extended period of time. Um, and so the two sisters in their retirement then transition to uh, being educators. Uh, they will continue to write on the question of abolition and uh, women's rights, but in a, a large sense, they will take a back seat to uh, what ends up happening in the movement from you know, the early 1840s through 1848, at least the, the rise of uh, what we call the women's rights movement and Seneca Falls. All of that, Activism is then made possible by the reform movements of the 19th century. The Second Great Awakening, which extends from uh, roughly the 1790s through the 1840s is an evangelical uh, Protestant movement that leads to a revival of religion and an expansion of uh, religious preaching throughout the United States. The West, the South, and the Northeast all experience this kind of uh, religious awakening. And it's that revivalism, especially in the North, that leads to reform. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of images, paintings from the period. This particular one is called Revival Meeting. It's from 1850 um, and it's painted by Jeremiah Paul. Christians responded emotionally um, at an open air revival meeting. This is held in the Granger Collection in New York City. The Second Great Awakening swept across the United States in the early decades of the 19th century, bringing religious camp meetings, such as the one depicted here, to rural and urban areas alike. Held outdoors, these gatherings allowed huge audiences to share in highly emotional experiences as they expressed their faith. 
During the Second Great Awakening, evangelical denominations such as the Methodists and the Baptists sent missionary circuit riders and itinerant preachers out to sermonize at campgrounds throughout the United States. And so this is a really important movement because it begins, this opens up this space for religious reform, but then also more radical reform movements. So the Northern revivals stimulate reform um, in a ver wide variety of ways. Um, not only moral reform societies, but also uh, temperance and the development of the benevolent empire. So we see the development of um, voluntary associations designed to stamp out sin and social evil, win the world for Christ. We see a network in New England of societies developing. So for instance, we have the um, Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions who sent missionaries to India. We have the American Bible Society distributing Bibles, mostly in the West and to areas where there were no churches or clergymen. What's important to note about this uh, revivalism to reform movement is that middle class people are the heaviest participants. Most are already active in their community. But what's interesting is that as we're seeing this industrialization and changes that capitalism brings, people anchor themselves to religion and to moral and ethical and ideological um, uh, different ideologies to help them see their way through this uh, quickly changing world. In addition, publishing and distributing, uh, in addition to publishing and distributing religi uh, religious tracts, we also see these tracts targeting new people, um, sailors, for instance, Native Americans and the urban poor are also part of these reform movements. The moral reform societies are attempting to curb irreligious activity on the Sabbath, stamp out vice, as I've mentioned, like dueling, gambling, and prostitution, which then sets the stage for the development of the temperance movement. And here again, uh, the Beechers are influential. Women are heavily involved in the movement because of the effect alcohol has on the family and because this is, again, a safe space in which women can participate, right? As moral arbiters of the home and as educators. Um, and so alcohol is seen as a real social evil that threatens the family because men then abused, neglected, or abandoned their families. It brings up the drinking habits of the poor and laboring classes. Working men, of course, will resist any effort by anybody to tell them how or when they should be drinking. But the temperance movement then um, gives birth to the American Temperance Society, which encouraged abstinence from alcohol. And like other reform movements, will send out lecturers and literature to convert people to um, the temperance movement. And a lot of this was done through propaganda. Um, here we see, for example, uh, this image that warns the drinkers who begin with just a glass with a friend that they will inevitably follow the direct path to poverty, despair, and death. Uh, not unlike the uh, fear-based advertisements we see today for a drug-free America, right? Um, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Um, not dissimilar here in this, in this image. Uh, similarly, the propaganda warned that the drinker uh, warned that drinking, though a part of regular everyday life in America, at home, at work, and at social gatherings, um, the temperance movement really gained steam by portraying the negative effects of demon drink on women and children, as we can see in this image here, a man consuming alcohol, and you can see everybody sort of uh, in despair as a result, no food, the fire is going out. Uh, is that a coffin there back there? I think it is. Um, and so, right, this is the negative effect of drinking. This reform then turns radical. I focused on the rise of radical abolitionism as it pertains 
to white people and largely a white movement. But we cannot forget that there are African-American abolitionists or were African-American abolitionists at the time who were also working uh, quite passionately to end slavery. Uh, chief among them, of course, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, one of the most famous conductors of the uh, Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman. Uh, we could go on and name others, of course, um, but African American abolitionists are also active at this time. And again, abolitionism gives, right, gives rise to women's rights because it opens that space for women to then uh, participate in political projects related to abolitionism. This is, uh, of course, Frederick Douglass. Um, who escaped from slavery in 1838 and became one of the most effective voices in the crusade against slavery. So we go from abolitionism to women's rights because abolitionism opens uh, up spaces for women to become involved. It raises an awareness among women of their inequality within the movement. And of course, we see women define conventional ideas of their proper place through the abolitionist movement. Um, one of the most insulting uh, things that happened to uh, American women in the anti-slavery uh, struggle, in the abolitionist struggle, is they are sent as delegates to the world's anti-slavery convention in 1840. And uh, many of these, all of the women, uh, their credentials are not recognized and they are not seated at the convention because they are women. And I think that was a major impetus for Lucretia Mott and others to fight for women's rights. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca Falls, New York was organized by Lucretia Mott, the Quaker, as well as Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, it was prompted by the experience of inequality in the abolition movement, and it's credited as beginning the movement for women's rights. Out of the convention comes the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled on the Declaration of Independence and demanded that women be given the right to vote, that women who are married be free from the unjust laws, their husbands, uh, the unjust laws giving their husbands rights over them, their property, and their children. And uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the leaders of the movement and she believed that it was in fact a mother's movement. So she's pictured here with one of her children. Um, she saw this as a mother's movement. Um, in addition to her pioneering work on women's suffrage, she also lectured on family life and childcare. And so to lay out some concluding thoughts, I really thought a lot about women's rights and the development of women's rights over the course of the 19th century. And I was struck by uh, something that I read from the colonial era and the resonance it had even in 1848. And this is the famous letter from Abigail Adams to her husband, John. Most people only remember the, the title of it, which in which she asks him to quote unquote, remember the ladies, right? But most people don't actually realize that she is demanding something from him. And what she is demanding from him is that they end men's rule over women and the oppression of women in marriage, right? To set out equitable laws that protect women. That's what she asked for. She asks him for, and I think the, the term she uses is a revision of your masculine systems. His reply, of course, is, uh, very disrespectful. He says to her something like, I cannot but laugh, right? And he calls her saucy, decides that he's not going to blot it out. Um, and then uh, says he expected rebellion from Indians. He expected rebellion from slaves. He expected rebellion from the riffraff, but he never expected rebellion from the tribe of women. And then he tells her, thank you very much for the advice, but we're going to keep our masculine systems as they are, right? And so we see here women in 1848 asking for the very things that Abigail Adams had asked for in 1890. And I think one of the narrative strands here to pull out is that women's contributions, both in the colonial era and here, they're only seen as being part of the private sphere, 
right? So it shuts off women's political activism and shuts off women's opportunity to enter that avenue because, right, it is within women's domestic sphere, right? So we're able to kind of shut down the idea of their contribution because we uh, catalog it as just simply being part of what women do in the home. So I leave you with this quote from Angelina Grimke's um, uh, petition to Southern women where she says, to remain silent in the face of evil is a form, is itself a form of evil. And so the major lesson that I drew out for today for myself as I was sort of considering this was the sisters believed that by making Black Lives Matter, what you're doing is freeing everybody else. And that there is no difference in the fight for abolition or for women's rights. But once you free the slave and once you get rid of white supremacy, you free everyone else as well. Thank you very much for listening to me and I really appreciate your time. Dr. Sierra, thank you. We have a few questions. Uh, one, uh, early in your talk, you mentioned uh, the Trail of Tears. And, yes. Uh, we have a, a listener who's wondering if you could connect the Grimke sisters if they take an interest in uh, what was uh, happening with regard to Indian removal. Uh, just, if you could. Sure. Fascinatingly, um, they don't. It's going on at the time when they're really becoming uh, abolitionists, uh, to, uh, really becoming uh, sort of converted to immediatism. And the in their letters, there is no mention of it whatsoever, which was really surprising uh, when I read it and really surprising to learn her when she researched it. They didn't mention much about the Trail of Tears at all, which was uh, quite shocking to learn her. And, I, and I, it was shocking to me as well as I, I read her account of that. Uh, also a question. Uh, uh, are any of Angelina's descendants around today? Do we know? Oh, good question. I do not know the answer to that question. That is a good question. I do not know the answer, unfortunately. Mm. The, uh, um, and uh, somebody wonders if you'll repeat the question because. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. The, me up that well, but, okay. Uh, uh, the, do you want me to go back? So the first question was about Indian removal and whether or not the sisters wrote about it, and they didn't. It was a surprise uh, to Lerner, who's the, the major historian who researched the sisters, and uh, I was quite shocked that they didn't uh, they didn't opine on it at all, even while it was uh, happening um, very close to them, in fact. And then the second question was on descendants. So. The second question was uh, whether or not Angelina Grimke has any living descendants, and I do not know the answer to that question, unfortunately. A uh, very good one, though. And uh, uh, one of the slides mentions the utopian, utopian community. Yes. Do you know which community that was? So um, the question was, one of the slides mentioned utopian communities for the Sisters and Weld. They uh, joined the Raritan Bay Commune, uh, it was not very successful. They bought into it, lost most of their uh, investment in that Raritan Bay commune in New Jersey. Um, and uh, they were never able to recover what they invested, but they were able to establish their first school and that sort of uh, enabled them to make a living. And then from uh, that school, they then build another school, a larger one. And that's the one they sort of keep for the rest of their uh, lives as they're active. Uh, both sisters die in the 1870s. The, uh, the connection to the, the uh, Beecher family uh, is reminiscent of uh, Lincoln upon meeting Harriet Beecher Stowe commented on her influence in national affairs and bringing us to where we were, were in uh, consciousness and the Civil War and so forth. Mm -hmm. The Grimke sisters, did they have that you know of that sort of influence in public policy and with leaders? So the question is, what kind of influence did the Grimke sisters have in public policy and with leaders? Uh, sort of making a comparison with Harriet Beecher Stowe and, and uh, the effect of Uncle Tom's Cabin on the Civil War era. Um, they on their tour, literally meet the who's who of, of reform, right? From the very conservative elements of reform to the most radical elements of the reform movement. They meet everybody who's involved in abolition. 
because of uh, women speaking in public and the um, controversy surrounding that, that gets enveloped and tied into the free speech movement and the gag rules that existed in Congress, right? And so one of the people that they meet on their tour uh, during their stop in Boston is uh, John Quincy Adams, who you know carried the flag of the free speech movement uh, at, in the House of Representatives, uh, presenting the women's petitions in order to try to um, get rid of the gag rule and to bring up the question of abolition in Congress. Um, so they did have that kind of influence. They were connected to some of the most important Quakers in Philadelphia when they moved there. Um, they are also very well connected in terms of the abolition movement. They know the Garrett Smiths of this world, the, uh, the, uh, the Tappans, the Westons. Um, through Weld, they know a whole host of more radical reformers, all of the uh, Lane's, uh, the Lane rebels, as well as others that uh, they come into contact with. I don't know if their influence was quite uh, as pronounced as you would say for, for uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, but certainly they did, um, did know Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They did know Lucretia Mott. They did uh, exchange letters with both of the women. So they, they certainly were engaged in, at least in that world, they were engaged in um, very clearly with the sort of elite of that world. Um, I think in the chat, uh, our, our viewers will see a connection. Uh, we have a, a viewer who uh, uh, gave us a link to a wiki tree family for Angelina Kirkie. Oh, wonderful. So uh, maybe that answer gives us a little clue on the descendants question. Uh, That's great. Uh, question, uh, can you comment a bit more on the close relationship that existed between the Stantons and the Grimkies in Seneca Falls? Gosh, I don't know it well. I wish I knew it better. Um, I do know more about the story of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her husband visiting the Grimkes and Weld at their home, their farmhouse, and staying with them, and the impression they had of each other initially. Um, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes that um, she finds the sisters to be very cold and very distant, and the food is awful, and oh my God, what am I doing here? Right, very simple. But then as she kind of gets incorporated into the household and sees how it runs, she finds that they're very warm, loving. They embrace people of all uh, backgrounds. They listen, um, they engage in debates, and um, they, they actually form a friendship, Angelina and Elizabeth Cady Stan form a friendship through that, um, that meeting that they have. Um, and it, it will be a lifelong sort of correspondence after that. Um, so the initial meeting, at least from uh, Elizabeth Cady Stan's, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stan's point of view was, uh, I'm not sure about these people after spending some time with them, she really finds them to not only be uh, extremely intelligent, but just uh, very generous and loving people. Were the uh, sisters actually at Seneca Falls? Um, good question. I don't think so. I don't think they traveled to Seneca Falls, if I recall correctly. They do sit on the board um, and they do sit on a couple of other boards, but largely their, uh, their involvement is correspondence. They won't um, speak in public. Uh, they will speak in public maybe one or two other times after the 1830s. Uh, same thing with Weld, his voice never really recovers. So he speaks in public. Um, near the end of his life, but then his voice gives out again and, and then he stops uh, doing so. Um, so I don't think they were there, but I, I can't remember uh, right now. Uh, uh, you obviously got people interested. One question is, uh, are there book, a book or books that you would recommend to learn more about the Grimke sisters? Sure. So um, Gerda Lerner's book on the Grimke sisters, the Grimke sisters of South Carolina is of course, a classic in women's history. And one of the reasons why I uh, picked it was, you know, it is the 100th year anniversary of suffrage. And so I thought it would be a, a, a good um, sort of resonant, have good resonance. Um, so Gerda Lerner's book, L-E-R-N-E-R, -E uh, The Grimke Sisters of South Carolina is the biography. It also includes um, the text, uh, the texts, because there are le multiple letters of both the letters on the equality of the sexes and um, Angelina's uh, letters to uh, Catherine Beecher and also the appeal 
in that book. And then Lerner, I think, has two other texts that you can read uh, where she um, sort of expands on that research. The um, Grimke Sisters of South Carolina, Pioneers for Abolition and, and, and Women's Rights, um, that book has a really interesting history because it um, was finished in 1959, but doesn't get published until 1967 because she couldn't find a publisher because nobody would be interested in it, is what she was told. Um, every publisher told her this, and they finally sent it, I think, can't remember if it was, I think it was Penguin was the last publishing house they sent it to, and uh, they accepted it with a title change. Um, but Gerda Lerner's uh, book is good. Uh, of, um, you could also read uh, Sue Monk Kids, The Invention of Wings, which is kind of based on the sister story, but again, is, is, a, um, is a narrative uh, fictionalized account. Um, the narrator in that one includes uh, the point of view of the slave that Sarah taught to read. That slave actually died when she was 13 or 14, um, but in the book, the slave li lives on and so sort of has a, a, a larger story to play. But that's a, another good entry point into uh, the Grimke sisters would be uh, the invention of wings. Could you speak a little to what brought you to be interested in the Grimke sisters? Oh, absolutely. Um, so what brought me in uh, to be interested in the Grimke sisters was uh, my teaching, in fact, um, you know, at an institution, a liberal arts institution like Thomas More, um, we teach large areas. So uh, in teaching U.S. history, um, I actually consulted with a colleague, a former colleague who's now retired um, and who hopefully is on here because he inspired me. In fact, um, uh, Ed Agrin sort of shared with me the um, the, the bibliography, the sisters, um, and I read it and I thought it would be a fantastic book for my African American history class. Um, and it is to me a fantastic book for the students. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not great, but um, I think they appreciated this uh, sisters pioneering work certainly um, in the semester that I taught it uh, or this semester as I taught it. Um, but it really comes from that uh, class and trying to teach uh, African American history at Thomas More, um, where it came from. So, uh, one of the cool things about chat and Zoom is we get live research. So, the question that was uh, asked earlier about uh, uh, did they attend Seneca, we have uh, 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 one of our viewers look this up and uh, quotes, although Sarah and Angelina did not attend. The first women's rights convention held in Seneca Falls in 1848. Sarah received an invitation to the event from Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Mm. National Park Service is the source on the that. The source on that, okay. Uh, which, if you haven't been to Seneca Falls, it's worth a trip. It's a, it's a really nice uh, area um, and, and a great uh, interpretive um, uh, feature there. Uh, so yes, okay, I did not know the invitation existed but I was right, they didn't actually uh, attend. So that's good. So I have a closing question for you from uh, Al Bailey, which I think is a really kind of a, a good way for us to close this evening. Does the Grimke sisters story, I'm being repositioned a little. Uh, <laughs> uh, does the, uh, the Grimke sisters story give you hope for today's culture and political divide? They came from one view and changed their view so it sounds like they did not get uh, to see their final goal of women's rights. Mm -hmm. I think it does. I mean, when we uh, read this in class, one of the things that the students told me was, well, I wouldn't share this book with somebody who's not already a convert to the movement, right? And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting that you wouldn't. Um, share that with somebody who's not already a convert, right? But I think that they, they do give me hope in the sense that they recognized the humanity in everyone, right? And I think that that was key for their transformation um, and that they were rooted in a culture that was very religious and um, rooted in a culture that also enabled them in a lot of ways to do what other women couldn't do, which is study, learn, and then go out, right? And, um, and advocate on behalf of others. Um, so they do, I think they, they bring me a lot of inspiration as I mentioned in my closing uh, comments, you know, they, they really uh, put forward this idea that if you make Black Lives Matter and you get rid of white supremacy, you improve life for everybody. 
Um, and I think we, we should start living and, and realizing that, that uh, start living in a culture and realizing that it is okay to be wrong and it is okay to change your opinion, right? Because otherwise um, we aren't gonna find common ground. And then the other thing that I always tell my students is compromise is terrible. Nobody likes compromise, but it's probably the best way to move forward because you don't get what you want, but then the other side doesn't get what they want. Everybody's unhappy, so it's fine, right? Compromise is probably the best way to move forward. And, and so that, that is where I, I draw my inspiration from, from the Greek sisters. Well, Dr. Sierra, thank you very much. Our uh, little band of social distance audience here would like to say thank you. I think there's applause from out there in the Zoom world also. So thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. This will be available on demand on our YouTube channel, so watch for that. Thank you.